Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Dad Bod History. I'm Jake. We got Eric and Cameron on tonight. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. Eric, um, before we get, get into what we're talking about, we're going to talk about the Russo-Japanese War. Um, but before we get into that, how was your weekend? How was your week? How was your Easter? It was good. So we're in spring break uh-huh. uh, the week before Easter. It was a good, relaxing spring break, pretty laid back. I got some work done, some things prepared for my next unit uh, to end out the school year. So that was good. My parents came into town. We haven't seen them. I saw my dad briefly in November, but I haven't, they haven't been in town since uh, July. So it was good to see them. Uh, And then we did Easter and uh, hilarious this morning. They, my, my wife set out an Easter egg hunt out in the backyard. She got all these metallic looking eggs. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the big egg as she calls it. The, uh, that's the resurrection egg. Sure. And, uh, and it's always, you know, empty, right? They open it up. There's no candy inside. It's, uh, you know, the tomb is empty, the right? The tomb is empty. So uh, they're all running around going for all these eggs. She's hidden them all over our backyard. And my daughter, she's almost 10, goes and grabs one, turns to go back the other way. And my three-year-old is there and she just knocks him on his rear. I mean, just flattens him. And then... You can see the hesitation. She wants to keep going for more eggs, but then she's like, ah, (laughs) uh, I want more eggs, but my brother's down. Not sure what I should do. So it became fine. Kind of full contact today. He was okay. He's fine. He got a need to be taken off the field, but then we took my parents to the airport and uh, my, both my boys must've just kept, they just, I mean, my youngest was just, drilling the candy down his throat the whole day. So we're in the car. We put the kids all the way in the back, going up the airport, and both boys are like, I'm not feeling too well. And I'm like, oh, Uh man. Like, it's a 20-minute drive to the airport. And then, like, we're three minutes from the airport, and one's like, something's coming out of my mouth. And I'm like, no, this is not (laughs) happening. Like, and, And it's the kind of situation we can't pull over before we get to the airport because once we pull over, it's going to be a situation that's going to take 20 minutes to deal with. So we got to get my parents to the airport and then we'll deal with it. So we get to the airport, um, the airport here in Bakersfield is pretty small. We pull up, everyone unloads the car. I see the signs that say, you must have a mask. And I'm like, that's not happening. Both the boys kind of book it over this grass field with my wife. I'm trying to get my parents out of the car. Nothing happens. I'm like, all right get everyone loaded back in the car. We're back on the road. And the youngest is like, I'm not feeling too well. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Pull off the side of the road on, you know, it's, it's a, it's a road. It's not a highway, but it's a high speed road. There's not a whole lot of room. So I pull off, get him out, let him stand there. Uh, And my daughter is kind of freaking out because daddy's standing by the side of the road with cars flipping by at 65 Got everyone home, no vomit, no throwing up. There we go. It was a moment. It was a moment. So, oh, that's an easy. Yeah, you get dad of the week right for uh, for that story. I don't even need to hear everybody else's stories, but that's uh, potential disaster <laughs> averted when you've got multiple puke that you know is is very much on the table, and you somehow sidestep that. Well done, sir. Yeah. I've never yeah. heard I've never heard of an almost puke. Like either you puke or you don't. <laughs> it's never threatened. It's never sitting right here and you force it back down. Oh no, so oh no. I, I have a friend who who uh, swears to me he's never thrown up. And I said, What do you mean? He says, Well, like I felt it coming and I've stopped it. And I'm like, What do you mean? He's like, It's com-. and I'm like, No, no, no. What no. Is he uh is he uh, like a a, a, a yogi on a mountaintop and he's apparently he complete control of his he body just <laughs> refused to let it Whatever. exit his mouth i'm like well i call gotta get wash. it out man i we're not doing that it's yeah. gross so anyways 
That was fun. If it's in your mouth, if it hits your mouth, you've thrown up. It's it's up. Okay. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure that yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying I don't agree with his assessment if that's his Well, I mean, respect to the guy, because if it actually gets into your mouth, that's I mean, that's a whole new level of commitment to not letting it go out. No, I, like you know what? Game. Okay, congratulations. And, and, into and this is do whatever you, you gotta do. This is on topic because well, I've seen I've seen both of you get sick. Uh, you know what came up this week with my parents in town? Oh God! <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, because uh, my sister got left uh, back at home with their two new dogs, and I guess she had to clean up after them. And my dad, you know, was talking to her. He says, "What's that like having to clean up after somebody when you got home?" <laughs> And uh, awesome. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know this, Cameron, but Jake got sick. Oh, I've heard the story. House. Okay, so anyway, I'm well versed. Yeah, on this story. I got sick at Eric's house. <laughs> That's all that happened. Yeah, there's it's nothing else. Very simple. <laughs> it, well, he had too much candy. We had too much candy, and it <sighs> made a mess. And Eric's dad got home from and, a long and here flight, you are, and he's you know, not here. happy. <laughs> But yeah. Now it just chalk it up to a good story. The relationship fine story. made a pretty awesome recovery. Not yeah. Bulgarian mafia level story. Years later. But no. No. No, it wasn't. Oh man. I thought Larry, who's probably one of the hardest people I've ever met to make mad in my experience. And I thought <laughs> he was never gonna forgive me after that. I, maybe he still hasn't. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's anytime you are over at, at my parents' house, that kind of like, hey, Jake, there's that knowing hey, tone in his voice. Are you going to get stupid drunk and throw up all over our guest bedroom again? Just just wondering. <laughs> I know it's been 12 years and you're married and have two kids now, but. Anything can happen. Yeah, you never know. Well, that's a great story. Um, Cameron, how about you, man? How was your Easter weekend or week? Yeah, um, my so my daughter is a little bit older than Eric's youngest son. So she's getting ready to be four next week. And um, I don't know what it is, the change in weather, the fact that she's not really napping anymore. But all of a sudden in the last two, three months, has she's just become an absolute terror. And um, what she subjected me to Friday morning was, you know, the, the worst one in a while. You know, we all we all deal with tantrums and, and you know, battles with our children. Um, but I, I don't know if you guys are like this or not, but every few months I need to battle one of my children just to make sure that they know that daddy's the boss. Right. <laughs> so my youngest. And, and it was a dumb fight. You know, she got into this, this mood where, Daddy, can you get me water? So she asked me, and, you know, that's fine. I just said, oh, um, you need to put away your uh, cup from last night. Um, and, and she refused. No, not going to do that. I said, well, okay, if you want to drink a water, you have to put your, your uh, water from last night away. So she goes over and over and over. And then she hits me with the, uh, you never do oh anything. Oh my gosh. You never <laughs> get me water. I'm I'm dying here. She's not yet 4 years old and she's laying it on this thick. So at this point I'm I'm out of the room. I'm walking away and you know, full on temper tantrum on the kitchen floor. Give her credit because she did not put away her cups for 25 minutes. 25 minutes of knockdown drag out. And I wasn't yelling. I, I totally kept my cool. But 25 minutes later, she finally just quietly puts her cups into the sink. Daddy, you put my cups in the sink. Can you please get me water? Sure, sweetie. There you go. And we didn't talk about it again. We didn't discuss it again. But that was um, one of the best battles in a long time over just literally a power struggle. And you know, you guys have both been dads long enough to know, like, sometimes you need to put your foot down. Like, sometimes you need to win this battle. That was one of those things where I just, 
daddy is, is undefeated lifetime when he puts his foot down <laughs> and she needed to know that. It's funny because um, it makes me feel good to know I'm not alone because my son is a pound for pound, the greatest fighter I've ever met. And luckily he's only like 30 pounds because he would wreck me <laughs> if he was any bigger. But I think it, everything you were saying there is like, yeah, this is my son. Like he, he just throws these really intense tantrums, I guess, you know, and it's, uh, it's refreshing to know. It's like, cause me and my wife are like, are we doing something wrong? Like, is our kid broken? Like, we don't know what to do, but it's like, no, this is as crazy as it is. This is normal. And sometimes kids just take it to the limit. Um, you know, but and it was and like over you said, nothing too. Sometimes it's over something. This was yeah. just hurt to be dominant, and it wasn't happening. No, I, 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 I get you. And it's, it's funny. Me and my son, we, we tend to butt heads more than me and my daughter. And he, the other day, I don't even know what we were fighting about, and it wasn't even really a fight. It's like I told him to do something that was ending his fun time, and he goes you ruin everything, daddy. I'm like, yep, I guess I do. I don't know what to tell you. And then he goes, you're fired. And then he goes, you're fired. I'm like, well, great. I, I'm out of a job. I go to my wife, I'm done. He fired me. I, do I have to leave now? Like, it's just like, I don't know. He's awesome. Even my, even my eight-year-old throws around that. Dick Ryan, the ruiner of all things. Yeah. What was that, Eric? My eight-year-old will throw around the, uh, you never, we never, you know, yeah. my little brother never. It's like, dude, yeah, no, just, we're not <laughs> doing that. He he does that a lot. Yeah. And uh, it's like, really? Like 10 minutes ago, this happened. So does that mean never? Do you understand never? Never um, doesn't mean never. Yeah. I don't know. I <laughs> guess we're, we're either all doing yeah, something. You'll wrong, never or, turn. Yeah. It's well, on a, Easter. on a lighter note. Um, so obviously Easter is today and my daughter woke up way too early um, in anticipation and she was so excited and she's like forces us all to get up and she sees all the Easter eggs out in the yard. And so we're like getting our shoes on to go out in the yard and pick up the Easter eggs. And she goes, all right, let's get hopping. And uh <laughs> <laughs> I laughed and then she said it again, mommy, let's get hopping. <laughs> and she's like, my, my wife was a little distracted at the moment. I think she's trying to help, help our son get ready. And, and she goes, what? And she goes, let's get hopping. And I'm like, just, just laugh, just laugh at it. And she's like, oh yeah, no, that's very funny, sweetie. And uh, apparently it's no time too early to start using dad jokes is what I learned with my daughter there. And it was really they work. They really work. proud moment. Yeah. I thought she, she killed it. So um, let's get hopping. Let's get hopping. So speaking of let's hey, get hopping. Cameron, you, what's with the background? Is that new? Um, yeah. Like in the yeah I, I just, my, my son and I like to hike the superstition mountains, not far from our house. And this is my favorite place so in Arizona. It's uh so that's where you're broadcasting from such today. A cool hike. Yeah, yeah, you know, just at the base of the superstitions. Uh huh. Excellent. Remote. <laughs> Got a great signal out there. <laughs> I, I noticed, Eric, you're you're sporting your um, dad bod uh, baseball shirt there again. I'm digging it, man. Again. If, if anybody's out there, like on the fence, considering getting those shirts, they fit fantastic. I'm almost seven feet tall, and the shirt actually fits me. Um, and we were joking about it on the tech strand. I might need to like dry clean that shirt cause it can never, ever be washed and shrunk. Um, yeah. can't recommend those shirts enough. I'm going to go buy 17 of them for myself. It makes you, I'll tell you what, your muscles will look bigger. Um, you'll look younger. Like, uh, -huh. it's a pretty great shirt. Like I, I put it on and I'm yeah. like, I'm like, and it fit like, honestly, it fit great. Like it was super comfortable and like, Jeez. it wasn't like it was long enough, you know, it was, it was great. Shout yeah. out to the Dutch woman on the mountaintop who hand yeah. makes each one. She did a great painstakingly. job. Painstakingly. 
Good job, Eric, picking her to make our shirts. <laughs> she killed it. Well, I, you know, ever since I met Greta, she's <laughs> good old. Greta. I, I knew she could put together these shirts <laughs> however we wanted. So, shout out to Greta on the mountain Greta, top, which is Greta, the name of a sweatshop textiles and, <laughs> yeah. textile shop. Greta Hosenmacher, I think, is her last name. Hosenmacher. All right, um, so let's get hopping. Um, yes. Before we get into our topic, the Russo-Japanese War, though, however, uh, we'd like to let you know Dad Bod History is sponsored by Transworld Business Advisors, our first sponsor. Um, if you own your own business, then you know the challenges of dealing with employees, customers, social media, government regulations, and the rest of it. With the pandemic coming to an end, there are hundreds of buyers coming to the marketplace looking for existing businesses to buy. So if you're ready to uh, cash out like I am with DadBot History, you need to call Transworld <laughs> Business Advisors today. They've got a database loaded with interested buyers and have over 40 years of experience in the industry. We will accept cash offers for DadBot. Yeah. <laughs> Million dollar start. Uh, they will guide you through the selling of a price, setting a price for your business. They have a database with sales data from tens of thousands of sold businesses, and they know the market price for your listing. Transworld also will find qualified buyers with their extensive reach and market leading uh, advertising. Uh, they'll ensure that the closing process goes as it should. And when you leave the closing table, you will get paid. Hopefully I will as well. And will be free of liability <laughs> and responsibility. Uh, if you're a buyer, Transworld can help you as well from evaluating a business to helping with funding. They are there for you all the way to your first day as the owner of your own business. Call today to set up a discreet, a discreet, very discreet, and very discreet and confidential consultation with a local representative. You can reach Jeff Peterson at 903-422-6818. That's 903-422-6818. Or you can go to www.tworld.com. Again, that is www.tworld.com. And I, I think we nailed that. I think we did a great job. I was just going to never, this is a real sponsor people. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't, this isn't bland's world. This is trans. Absolutely world. This is not. the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. All right. So trans world business advisors. Um, so let's get started with our topic. Um, Russo Japanese war. And I think this is one that I kind of picked um, because I didn't know anything about it. Like I remember, reading about the Russo-Japanese War, like in passing, you know, when you're going through modern era Europe and, and Asia and you're like, oh yeah, the Russo-Japanese War. And, but that was it. I think I'd never read into it at all. I just knew it was a war that happened before World War I. And so for me, the reason I wanted to do this, this series, we're gonna do probably a three-part series on this, was so that I could study up on it and and see well what was the Russo-Japanese War about? What effect did it have on World War One, World War Two, and kind of what effect did it have on Japan and Russia, um, the Russian Empire at the time? And that's how I think we got here. Um, I don't know about you, Eric, or you, Cameron, but that's that's kind of where I yeah. I mean, obviously, you inspired. You, you pitched this to us, and and I think I've come across it in passing as well, specifically uh, as I teach uh, both World War One and the Russian Revolution, one of the things that I discuss in the Russian Revolution is, is what's the situation in Russia prior to the revolution? Who's in charge? Czar Nicholas II uh, mm -hmm. from his coronation in 1894, I believe. Uh, and, you know, uh, 1904, 1905, when this war happens, there's a revolution in 1905 that is partly the result of the mismanagement of this war on the part of the Russians. And that just feeds into everything that's going to happen in Russia uh, leading up to World War I and then the Russian Revolution. Uh, and, and again, as, as we kind of dive in, there's a couple points I want to make. One is I, I think uh, this is probably going to be a really deep dive topic for us, but um, I want to keep in mind it's, uh, just kind of this conversation we're having. The impact that this war, again, very few people talk about it pretty openly, that this war had on not just World War I, but also had on the entire 20th century 
uh, because it's going to affect how different empires approach war. It's going to affect how we approach uh, World War I. World War II will be affected by this. Uh, future wars in the Korean Peninsula and Manchuria will be affected by this. So it's it's been fascinating to do my own deep dive in the research on this, and and I'm I'm hoping we can uh, really get a lot out of this, not only for ourselves but for our audience as well. Uh, I agree. And and real quick before we do it, I just want to say for my research. Um, <laughs> I used two books primarily, and I did some internet uh, sleuthing um, on Wikipedia and, and some other internet uh, databases. Uh, one was called Tsushima 1905, Death of a Russian Fleet, uh, written by Mark Lardis from Oxford Press. And then the other one was The Russo-Japanese War, uh, 1904 to 1905 by Jeffrey Jukes, um, yeah. also uh, Ermina uh, Oxford Osprey. Press. I think both yeah. of these are Osprey, not Osprey. Yeah, I've got that one as well. I'm I'm also working through Rising Sun and Tumbling Tumbling Bear by Richard Connaughton. Um that I that I highly recommend. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of piggyback off of what you guys said is and I say this all the time, history is best understood in context. And and again, in the his, in my history books growing up, there was a one paragraph on this war. And I didn't realize how much it connected to, you know, World War One, the Russian Revolution, and really World World War Two as well. You know, we'll get into all of that stuff without giving anything away. But um, this had far-reaching effects for generations in multiple countries outside of just Russia and Jap Japan, um, which I thought was was really cool. And as we go into our deep dive, we'll understand that better. Um, but really a fascinating topic for sure. Absolutely. And it's, uh, yeah, it's full of what ifs this, this whole, this whole war is full of mm -hmm. what if questions. Um, so let's, uh, awesome. let's get rolling, I guess. And, um, so in my, my reading and my, I guess, initial research is, is I saw these two countries, um, the Russian empire and Japan and, in some regards, they were following similar similar paths um, in the late 1800s to early 1900s in that they were both technologically and imperially speaking far behind uh, the European powers and to a lesser extent far behind America um, in terms of technology and empire building. Now, Russia by existence is an empire. I mean, it's the largest contiguous uh, nation on earth still to this day. Um, but that land, largely that empire was uninhabitable or unusable uh, Siberia and the tundra, you know, and Japan on the other hand was behind the rest of the world by choice. Um, from the 1600s to the 1800s, they were in a period of called isolationism, where they had very limited contact with the Western world, um, even with some of their Eastern neighbors. Um, they were very closed off. And um, by design, by, by yeah, they, by, by choice, they were ruled by the Tokugawa shogunate, um, which was um, a clan that the Tokugawa clan, which kind of was a warlord type dictatorship and they had very restricted contact with the western world um, for about 214 years and it was called uh, the sakoku laws which was closed country laws um, they only traded directly with china korea and the netherlands they had indirect trade with like spain and england um, but largely they they said we don't want all this western influence to kind of ruin our way of life and um as a result they threw out all the christian missionaries that were in there they restricted their ports um i think the only europeans that were allowed to directly trade were the dutch in the netherlands um and you know they just kind of had this regression um right as everyone right as the rest of the world and by rest of the world i guess i mean europe was in the process of colonizing and empire building, Japan 
was in the process of retreating um, to within themselves. So it was, uh, it's kind of the initial. And I do wonder I how much hear. of that is as a result of, of what they had seen happen in other countries with European uh, imperialism, you know? So Japan, the one city that allowed <clears throat> foreigners was Nagasaki, was the port of Nagasaki. To the point that they tried when, and you know, this is looking a little ahead, when, um, you know, Matthew, Commodore Matthew Perry, not of NBC, Friends his fame. show Friends fame, yeah. but the actual the Commodore, US <laughs> Commodore of the US Navy, they tried to redirect him and say, you can go to Nagasaki. He's like, no, no, I know where I'm going. I'm going to Edo because I need to talk to who's really in charge here. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, by the, this by design, because in China, in other parts in Asia, where they had allowed European powers to come in and set up trading posts that also then allowed those European powers to start to influence further inland into other cities and soon the British and the Germans and the French and the Spanish had a foothold in these other countries and had enough money that they had enough political power to actually affect the laws and policies in those nations. So Japan, you know, while it might allow for some regression and, and uh, stagnation in progress, was actually preventing themselves from being colonized and imperialized by others. Absolutely. And, and, and part of their retraction or withdrawal from the world was, you know, the European, specifically Christianity was, was making inroads into Japan. And there was a, the Shimabar rebellion in 1637, which was mostly Christian peasant uprising. Um, and so the Tokugawa clan used that as a means to say, well, this is why we need to get rid of all these Western and European ideas because it's upsetting the order. Now you could say, well, it's a peasant uprising. It's not necessarily because they're Christians, but probably because they're tired of being peasants. Um, but whatever the reasons, that's what happened. And I would agree in that sense is that, yeah, they were successful. They weren't colonized. Although Japan, as opposed to Manchuria, which we'll learn about as we go through this, you know, China and Korea and other parts of Asia, Japan didn't have much to offer in terms of raw resources like much of the rest of Southeast Asia did. And so maybe they weren't that tempting um, as far as a as a place to conquer, it wasn't necessarily worth the trouble. Um, but suffice it to say, when Commodore Perry came by in 1853 with those American gunboats and he did his gunboat diplomacy, everything kind of changed. It changed pretty quickly for Japan. Um, specifically, once Japan learned that they couldn't kind of ignore the Western world. They, um, the Tokugawa shogunate fell um, in 1868 and was uh, replaced with the Meiji Restoration, which was the Meiji Emperor, um, which kind of ended the isolationism policy of Japan. And after that, when Meiji took over, they, they tried to make up for 200 years of falling behind in a matter of 50 years, like they just went full speed ahead um, towards industrialization and adopting Western economy and cultural and not so much cultural, but economic practices and and uh, military strategy and stuff like that. But, but in order to do so, they have to <clears throat> adopt some of the culture, some of the dress, some of the norms that come from, well, this is what a successful uh, industrial economic nation has. They wear these outfits. This is how they, they, they kind of present themselves. If we adopt those things and we can also be successful. Now in that Meiji restoration, uh, you also had some, some pushback, right? Many of the samurai in Japan, seeing that this is a way to go, joined that Meiji uh, administration so they could maintain some of their, their power, some of their prestige. But a lot of samurai seeing this shift away, notice that any shift towards more Western policy is gonna give a lot of power to individuals, especially individuals of lower classes. So you have this rebellion, the Satsuma rebellion 
in 1877, um, somewhat fictionally uh, portrayed in The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. Um, it's kind of loosely based on real events. And that rebellion was a rebellion of samurai. And it wasn't, you know, a full armed conflict, but it was a, hey, you are upending and uprooting our culture and how we do things, our traditions. We have this status quo where, yes, samurai have a lot of power. Samurai are in charge. We hold a particular position in the government and how things are administered here. By throwing that all away under this Meiji uh, restoration, we are we're losing our position and we don't want that. And so, of course, they some of them fought it. Some of them went along with it. Um, but the samurai, you know, the top knots were discouraged. Uh, some of the samurai dress and the carrying of swords was discouraged. And so those cultural aspects um, were going away. Now, to be fair, I'm sure a lot of peasants were thrilled that samurai were no longer able to just execute them on the spot. Um, so there's some benefits, I'm sure, that you can see right away. But um I can't imagine being in a position of, of being in Japan during this time and saying there's an intentional shift in our culture from our traditions, what we're always used to, we're, we're all used to, to something completely new and foreign. Yeah. And that's kind of a, speaking holistically, that's a, something that nations and peoples from now and going back until time immemorial is have dealt with is, you know, how do we adapt without losing who we are, so to speak. And Japan had to figure that out real quick because uh, they didn't have time to not industrialize because there was threat. European powers are gobbling up colonies all over the world. And they had an existential threat to how can Japan survive and still be Japan? And, and that's something that uh, they well, had that, to answer. That's a, that's a big philosophical question for us today is how can we survive and remain the best parts of what we are? Yeah. And every country is trying to answer that because <clears throat> if you're going to make progress, you're going to have to shed something. Uh, and if you shed something, if you shed the wrong thing and you lose who you are that makes you who you are, then uh, is it, has it been all in vain? Mm -hmm. So conversely, if you hold on, you get left behind, you get left behind or in the case of Japan, just become another, just another colony to another European yeah. power. Yeah. So, and I was going to ask a question of you guys is, as I was reading this, I kept thinking, um, you know, when it comes to Japan versus Russia, it, it seems to me that Japan had a lot more to gain from this whole conflict than Russia did. Um, because of what you guys are talking about right now, you know, they're, they're trying to imperialize, they're trying to expand, you know, they're a very small island nation that to this point has been largely isolationist. Um, and the fact is that they had very little land to work with, but, you know, here's Russia that was, you know, a, a global superpower at that point. Um, I kept thinking that what is Russia doing even getting into this fight um, because of Japan and, and where they were at that point? Well, to, I guess to answer your question, camera, I agree with you. I think Japan had way more to gain from this conflict than Russia did. And I think as we go through this, we'll see that play out. But Japan also had the most to lose because if they lost this fight, there's a good chance Russia expands into, into the Japanese islands. Right. Um, so I, I absolutely agree that they had the most to gain. They also had the most to lose. Um, yeah, and, Eric, and what were you gonna say? as far as uh, Russia being a global superpower at this point, I, they, they really aren't. What they're looking to gain is a an all a year round port in mm. Port Arthur, right? They have they have Vladivostok, um, which is on the eastern coast of Russia, uh, but that you know does get frozen in sometimes. It's also going to be locked in behind Japan. <clears throat> 
St. Petersburg is frozen for half the year. They have uh, the Crimean Peninsula on the Black Sea, but then they have to go through the Bosporus. And that's where Turkey meets Europe. That's where Istanbul is. And if they don't have an agreement with Turkey, it's all dependent on Turkey or at this point, the Ottoman Empire. So um, for Russia, this is about not about maintaining global superpower status. This is about getting into the game because in 1894, uh, 1900, 1904, this is the same time that the United States is beginning our big steps into imperialism, right? We're, we're having our war with the, we're having the Spanish American war. We're trying to, uh, claim Cuba and get, we're going to end up with Puerto Rico and the Philippines and start looking at Hawaii. So, <clears throat> Russia and the United States are playing this, how do we get into the game that France and Britain and Spain have been involved in for years? Um, and for Japan, I, I'd say they've got a lot to gain because if they can gain Korea, the Korean Peninsula and Manchuria, well, that's pretty close to home for them. They can do something with that. For Russia, it's, <clears throat> it's at their frontiers. It, it might be right next to their borders, but it's it's at the frontier of their, their nation. And it's, you know, if you look at Russia, like 80% of their population is west of the Ural mountains, which is on the European peninsula. So other side, yeah. You know, there's resources out there for them. They want that port because it simplifies things for them, but um, you know, it's a pretty long reach for Russia, I think to yeah. go for these ports. Um, but in, and here's something that I've noticed in reading, and I think this is a good time to shift from Japan to Russia, is I feel like Russia, so Russia was behind the rest of Europe as well, but they've been trying to catch up to Europe since the 1600s, since Peter the Great. And they'd made some advances, um, and Peter the Great was the first to really build a Russian Navy, right? After his travels through Europe, he was the first to make that a goal. And then eventually, I don't know if he did it, or if it was Catherine, but that one of the two was able to get that port in the Crimean Peninsula. And and they and Catherine the Great expanded east. Um, and I think during her term or her time as Empress, she um that's when Russian America was, which is now Alaska, was was being colonized, so to speak. So they'd been they've been playing catch up to Europe for for centuries, literally, um, but they could never quite do it. Um, they were always st stuck behind technologically, and they were always stuck behind socially. Um, you know, they were they, and maybe because this is how they had to survive, it being so big, they had to be an autocratic dictatorship um, under an emperor. Whereas the rest of the European powers didn't; they they could they could function more democratically um, and more administratively than Russia could because the homeland, the home fronts were secured usually unless Germany and France or England started to have border clashes, but then they could administer, you know, with um, the East India trading company and, and, and all these other ways. And so they could kind of, they were like a large corporation really, you know, and they had subsidiaries. That's what their colonies were. They were subsidiaries of England or France or Germany, whereas Russia tried to control everything directly. Um, and, and the point being is, is they've been playing catch up to the rest of Western Europe, but they couldn't quite cross over that threshold. They couldn't quite get to that. We're just as good as you, Europe, step. And I think part of it was ego um, to the czar because he was cousins with Kaiser Wilhelm. And I think he was also related to Queen Victoria. Oh, uh, I think they're yeah, all the I same mean, family. So it's, I, I, it's wild. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's cousins to George the fifth. And if you look at, if you look at them side by side, they're nearly twins. And then he's also uh, related to Kaiser Wilhelm through, through marriage and, Again, I, I did this a, a few weeks ago with my my students looking at this family tree because everyone in Europe is related, is uh, either a granddaughter or grandson of Queen Victoria or you're a grandchild of Christian the Ninth of Denmark. Yeah. And, and and those two kind of manipulated everything to make sure that if you are 
in England, Denmark, Germany, Russia, Austria, you're related. The only ones who are not closely related to those families are in France and Italy, but everyone else is, is pretty tied into those yeah. two families. Um, and yeah, as you said, with ego, it's, it's not just ego against other empires. It's, it is literally family, right? So yeah. our Nicholas II looks at Kaiser Wilhelm II and says, look at his Navy, look at the dreadnoughts he's building. I want yeah. those dreadnoughts too. And that's yeah. going to yeah. be, so I, I, I guess that answers my question then is, is I, didn't perceive that properly that, you know, here I was thinking that Russia was up there in that same echelon as the Britain, as the France, but that wasn't the case. So maybe they, you know, it it was a little bit of a reach for them, like you guys said, outside of the, the friendly confines to go to war with Japan, but they felt like they needed to do that in order, in order to bolster their position up to, get to that power of, of, of where Western Europe is, is, is kind of what you guys are saying. Well, and, and you're in a sense, though, you were right. Nobody ever wanted to fight Russia. I mean, Napoleon was the last one that really did it. And we all saw how that ended um, with him, you know, and when his grand army was destroyed more by Russian winter than Russian military, but um Nobody wanted to fight Russia and and they were definitely a power, but like, they were just like everyone. I think England at this time was the crown jewel. If you were to say of empire building, um, they had the best Navy they had. I mean, yeah, the U S was gone, but they had Canada. Uh, they had holdings in South Africa. They had holdings in Southeast Asia, India. Um, I mean, they were everywhere and, I don't know, and Australia at this point as well. And Caribbean. Yeah. And, and so they just, they had everything. And then France had empire, you know, uh, modern day Indochina, which is modern day Vietnam. Uh, Germany was getting into the game. Like, and I think Russia saw that or the czar and he's like, that's, that's what we need to do to, to take the next step is we need to get into empire building and not just contiguous landmass, but colonies and, and, I think this was their real first foray into that. Um, But they never could quite, well, we'll see. I mean, they they had a massive Navy, but they could just never quite catch up to what Europe was. But Japan was in Europe. And I think that's a, we'll see here is that the Europeans in general and the Russians specifically had a very dim view of Japan and much of Southeast Asia. They thought they were, uh, less developed and barbaric and it would be kind of a rollover um, kind of fight for them if it ever did come to war. Well, and that's um, something that the U S not proved, but demonstrated with Matthew Perry's fleet was they showed up, they showed their guns, they blew a few off to say, oh, we're just celebrating the 4th of July, nothing to see here. Oh yeah. These big guns. Yeah. Just, you know, they're for show, but demonstrating to the Japanese that, militarily we can roll over you now that's in 1853 and 1854 mm-hmm. and at that point had the u.s wanted to roll in there they probably could have made an impact what mm-hmm. japan opted for instead was let's open up and let's embrace what we see as the future we'll maintain as much of our own tradition and culture as we can but let's embrace what we can learn from these other countries And like we said before, Japan very quickly said, we're sending our uh, our sailors, our soldiers, our uh, politicians to other countries, our samurai. We're sending them to other countries to learn the other ways. And we see this all the time. The American universities are filled with people who've been sent from other countries to learn here. It happens constantly. And that's a smart move. It, it, and not to go off on a tangent, it would be smart for America, for the United States to be sending more of our students to other parts of the world so we can make sure that we're not pretending like we're the only ones with any good knowledge. There's other ways to learn, other things to learn. Japan does this, and it's one of the smartest moves they make, because when this war happens, 50 years after Matthew Perry opens 
Japan up to the West, Japan has learned how the West fights its wars on land, fights its wars on the sea, uh, and how they do diplomacy. And again, uh, something we're going to see out of Japan that that doesn't seem to jive with the West, but Japan, for them, it makes sense. It happens on February 8th, 1904, and December 7th, 1941. They declare war six hours after they launch an attack. And to them, they say, this is how we're going to operate this. Um, Yeah. And I mean, that is something that they spend their time learning over that, that course of 50 years from the West is how to do what I think it's going to be Otto von Bismarck says is real politic, right? Mm -hmm. If we're going to do this, we're going to do it to win. Yeah. And okay, so let's uh, because I'm a little excited, so thanks for that, Eric. Um, so let's get into what Japan and Russia did in the pat in the 50 years leading up to the war, and then specifically, oh, I'm sorry, the 10 that, years. Was, that was Ludwig von Rakow, not Bismarck, but I think Bismarck, well, I think Bismarck was Bismarck the first one who employed it. it, yeah. But so, like you said, they sent their, their engineers, their brightest students, um all across the world to learn. They sent them to the Americas, Canada and America. Um, They sent them to England, to France, to Germany. They modeled their Navy after the Royal Navy of Britain, which was the best Navy in the world at the time. They modeled their army after the Imperial Army of Germany because they had just trounced France in the Franco-Prussian War. So I think they originally had them in France. They modeled, they were originally going after France and then France lost to Germany and they're like, we're gonna switch tack here. So they were very like, (laughs) Pragmatic. We're going to see what the winner. We're going to see what the winners do, and that's what we're going to base our military off of. And they're going to say we're going to see how, how the winners build their ships, and that's what we're going to base it off of. And so it was very like reminds like me of said, the modern day NFL. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. There goes the Wildcat. Um, yeah. Right. Everyone thought the <laughs> Wildcat was great, and then the Wildcat blew out some knees, and there that goes. You know, and so they they adapt, and right, nothing stays a secret for long. And and that's a great analogy, Cameron. Is is they saw what the I mean? Did. Sign stealing works. I don't know why they don't allow it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Move those trash cans. But in, in Russia, and, and so they oh, I stayed on Japan, um, and then they built a naval academy. And in this academy, they it became an avenue for the peasantry to have a career outside of farming, and and so they said. You know, you got to be able to read and you got to go to the academy for three years and you got to do a year on the ship. And then you've got to like, and then they had like a whole system, much like the European Navy on you get promoted through merit and you get promoted through accomplishment and ability. And so it was very uh, a meritocracy. And, and so they're accelerating their ability to have competent officers and competent sailors, and then on the army side, competent soldiers. And just in this 50 year period, and it was just amazing how fast they did that. And they started building dry docks and um, for their ships to be built and repaired. And they just did everything they could to catch up because they knew to them, it was an existential threat if they couldn't catch up. In Russia, was also building a big Navy and they also had a Naval Academy, but it was still stuck in this old world mentality of officers are the sons of noblemen and sons of landed families. Mm -hmm. And we use conscripts for our Navy and for our sailors and our, you know, grunt infantry and we don't educate them and we don't train them and we don't like, and so they had these massive armies and these massive navies, but they weren't putting in the work. They were just assuming that their numbers, which had worked for them before, would be able to work for them now in this new modern world. Yeah, it's it's interesting how much geography can dictate history and dictate tactics and dictate <clears throat> necessity, right? So Germany... France, Italy, England, uh, if you look at them, they're roughly all the size of Texas, right? And so if you are that size and somebody invading and, and grabbing 
a few hundred square miles on your, your frontier, that hurts you. And so you have to always be a step ahead and you always have to be working on uh, making progress in terms of your technology and your tactics. If you're Russia, you know you have a massive amount of land. Losing a little never seems to be the worst thing in the world. And you always have something you can fall back on, which is we have twice as many people here as any other country. Uh, our winters are harsh. You can come here, but we will defeat you. Uh, and so the idea that even though they abolish pe uh, what the uh, uh, feudalism, peasantry Serfdom. in 1867, uh, or yeah, the serfdom, right? The people belonging to the land, they abolish that, but they don't abolish the classes, right? The class system still exists well into the 20th century. And that's going to fuel the, the Russian revolution as well. But if, if your leadership is all based on favors and landedness and nobility, you're not making the progress that Japan will by saying, hey, anybody and everybody, we are completely changing our society. Show up. We're going to take the best of the best and we're going to take all of you and actually train you, teach you. Uh, we're going to teach you how to read and write, how to think critically, how to make our country better. I mean, right off the bat, if you make everybody better you're going to have enough people to make good decisions to help you succeed against somebody who's saying we're only picking from those who we've handpicked already and well, the rest are just fodder. And I think this is the first war where this really matters. Like even the civil war, which is kind of the last war before machine guns become a thing and, and, you know, steamships and all this are, are the way of the world and, and heavy cannons, like that, you know, you can, you can get by with just having a massive army of guys that walk in a line and get shot and shoot back. And yeah, they have to have some training, but you know, if you have enough of them, eventually you're going to overwhelm the opposing force, no matter how well trained they are. And this war is the first one where that doesn't work anymore. That, that it matters the quality of soldier that you have from the, from the, uh, what of a buck private up to, uh, the commander in chief. And I think that's the Russian, the lesson that Russia wasn't ready to learn yet, um, in this war. And, and they just, you know, they were so used to overwhelming their opponents. They overwhelmed Napoleon. They over, you know, like they never, they overwhelmed um, Mongolia. They overwhelmed Turkey. Like that's how they won is they just were bigger and they had more people. They didn't need to necessarily be better. Um, so as you guys are talking about this, I keep, what keeps popping into my head is, you know, Japan spending all of this money to train their soldiers and, and have a system that, really gives them an identity and, and teaches their soldiers and humanizes that their people. Um, but, you know, that's not without financial cost. So, you know, to kind of go back to that, that last point is I got to believe that Japan has even more skin in the game at this point too. You know, not only do they have more to gain and more to lose, but they've spent a tremendous amount of money in order to, Kind of revamp their military in anticipation of hey we're we're going out and and trying to imperialize um true i mean is that did that play a part in in all of this I, I, um, i'd say to some extent yes i'd say japan even even making this jump ahead is not going to be so concerned with building an empire themselves just yet <clears throat> but preventing themselves from becoming Part of. imperialized because China at this point, you know, there's been their boxer rebellion. Um, they've, they've had some pushback well, against was everyone prior. in China and, and throughout Asia, it, it's all owned by European powers. I mean, Germany owns part of Malaysia. I think the French are in Indochina. The British own all these ports along along China itself. Japan just doesn't want to be like that. They don't want to be colonized. Yeah. At the same time, they're also seeing the Korean Peninsula 
in Port Arthur, um, which is off the coast of, of uh, Manchuria, the, Manchuria in, in Korea, uh, they've already taken it once from China. That is a natural kind of first step for Japan to build their empire. And so that's where I say the Korean peninsula is going to have a bigger impact and a, a greater bearing on the 20th century than I, than I previously realized, because it's going to be the flashpoint for this war. And the focal point for this war is over this peninsula and this strip of land called Manchuria uh, that, that isn't really controlled by anyone yet. It has, has changed hands multiple times. It is going to be this, this point at which this conflict meets and uh, it's going to other con world war two is going to be fo focused on these areas as well. The Korean war is going to be focused on this area. Um, so, so getting into that, Eric, and I think this is a great setup, the motives for this war and the causes all hinge on the Korean Peninsula and Port Arthur, which is on the Liaodong Peninsula in Manchuria, which is west, just like just west of Korea. And um, it's a warm weather port. Um, so it's never frozen, which is why Russia wants it. So Russia is in, in their empire building They're uh, making inroads into Manchuria. They've recently constructed their Trans-Siberian Railway, um, connecting Vladivostok to um, St. Petersburg, which is, God, it's going to be the 10, I'm gonna, I don't know how many thousands of miles that is, but they connect Siberia, they connect Russia via rail. Um, and then they're moving south into Manchuria. And Japan not in an empire building mode, but in a defensive mode, they are going to war with Jing, uh, the Jing China dynasty, who was previously their overlords in 1894. They take the Liaodong Peninsula from Jing China in Manchuria, and they have control of what we know as Port Arthur. However, Russia, in a bit of savvy diplomacy, um, was able to get France and Germany to force Japan to give up the peninsula because Russia said, yeah, Japan, you shouldn't be able to have that. China should be able to be free and you got to give that up. And so Japan was not willing to fight Russia, Germany, and France. And so then Russia very smartly signed a lease with Manchuria to lease the use of Port Arthur. And so then they started building up Port Arthur with Russian forces in like 1895. Yeah, and so then that, after that, go ahead. That that railway, like you said, it's it's just over fifty seven hundred miles, <clears throat> right? The Trans Siberian Railway from, I think, Moscow to Vladivostok. And Vladivostok, like we said, if you if you leave the port of Vladivostok, if you go north, you're going by Hokkaido, Japan, which is the the northernmost island. If you go south, you're going by uh, Honshu, and uh, well, Honshu is the main island, and I think it's Shikoku. Um, is the southernmost island. So you're kind of trapped in by Japan. Japan forms an arc around the Sea of Japan, which Vladivostok is on. Uh, and and yeah, Russia's diplomacy here is kind of interesting because they have that railway. And by leasing that, what they then did was they built another railway from, from Chita in Russia across to Vladivostok, across Manchuria, rather than around it, and then south mm -hmm. to Port Arthur. And now they have a railway that they own that's in Manchuria. And now they have this kind of ongoing influence in the area that allows them to take ownership in it. Yeah. So, and, and actually Japan was fine with that. They're like, fine, Russia, you have Port Arthur. That's fine. And what happened was, is Russia and Japan started exerting influence over the Korean Peninsula because in Japan, Korea is so important because it's, it's kind of like the English Channel. You know, if you from Busan, Korea to Japan is just a matter of maybe 50 miles or so. It's not a very big gap. And, and so it would be a launching point for an invasion from Korea into Japan. And it, and so, it has been. A launching point many invasion, times right? the mongols that's where they launched from they used korean ships to i mean they were failed but that's what they used was korea 
to, to send their fleet into Japan. Um, and so Japan wants to negotiate with Russia in 1903 and 04, and they started opening up these negotiations saying, hey, Russia, let's figure out our, our spheres of influence. And Japan basically wants the Korean Peninsula and Russia's more focused on Manchuria. But Russia also wants the Korean Peninsula. They want it all. And they think they can have it because they're bigger and badder than Japan is. And uh, so Japan, in a savvy form of diplomacy, forms an Anglo-Japanese alliance. So an alliance with England. And they basically set this alliance to say, that means if Russia goes to war with Japan, they also go to war with a Britain, with Britain. And it means if, so if Russia declares war or starts a conflict with Japan, they're automatically at war with Britain, which is something they do not want because that's a war that they would lose. And so Japan gets this alliance in 1902. So Russia knows, okay, well, we can't attack Japan, but we can still exert our influence on Manchuria and Korea. And so then Japan kind of uses that to buy time to build up their army, to build up their Navy and to set up to say, all right, well, if we got to go to war with Russia, we got to get ready for it. And um, I think it was in January of 1904, January 13, 1904, Japan sends a letter to Russia saying, here's our final offer. You can have all of Manchuria, just let us have Korea, which technically, and here's something that we need to just get out there. <laughs> there's Koreans living in Korea. There's Koreans living in Korea that probably don't want to be conquered by either one. And there's Chinese that are living in Manchuria that definitely don't want to be conquered by Japan or Russia. But that's the world as it was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is that whoever was biggest and strongest got to take over whatever well, they wanted, basically. That's, that's the world we live in today in some circumstances. We're a no, little that, bit more aware of it, but... Yeah, I mean, if you're bigger and badder, you can make policy for a group of people on a strip of land somewhere else. That's true. And, and but I, I guess it was uh, like a, like I was saying with you know this was the first war where training matters. I guess this is this era is the first era where yeah, I mean that's a truth, right? The yeah. winner makes the rules. But this is the first time that the winner can project power anywhere they want at any time. Right. England, the sun never set on the British Empire. This is what like they controlled 25 percent of the land mass from their tiny little island north of mm -hmm. Europe. They controlled 25 percent of the land mass of the earth um, under the English Empire at the time. That I guess that's where I'm just like. Right. It's so odd. It's like, well, why are Russia and Japan fighting? And like, why can't they get along? It's like, well, I would think the Koreans and Chinese probably want to say that's all. That's, I'm just. Yeah. Yeah. You know. they, they probably would. <laughs> but I mean, for their. They're behind. Korea has been, you know, conquered multiple times by multiple different people. Um, and so but, Japan, it, with the ability to make these long yeah. jumps ahead, is able to influence I'll Korea in a way out. that Korea can't yeah. flush off. So anyway, Japan makes their offer on the 13th of January, 1904. They say that Manchuria is all yours, Russia. Just let us have Korea. Russia ignores the offer. They just don't even answer. And so then Japan's like, well, we're going to war. And they sever diplomatic relations on February 4th. And then on February 8th, 1904, they launch a surprise attack on Port Arthur um, with their Imperial Navy um, and against the Pacific, Russian Pacific fleet in Port Arthur at the time under Admiral Stark was the Admiral. So that's kind of Tony Stark. What, yeah. Iron Tony Man? Stark. Oh, Any man. relation there? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there this is. is Tony, this guy's related to Tony Stark. He's like, he's from the I mean, wrong side. We of got he is. Tony Stark. We got Matthew Perry. This is <laughs> amazing how history just ties everything together. It yeah. Repeats. Friends and the MCU. Just yeah. that's everything right there. It's all connected in Port Arthur. <laughs> uh, and, and I, I think we're not going to get into the Battle of Port Arthur, the attack tonight, correct? No, not really. Um, but, you know, as we get into this, one of the interesting things is, uh, and I need to look at the name of the town, uh, Chimolpo, which is now Incheon, that port there that's on Korea has Russian ships in it 
and German ships and British ships and American ships. And the Japanese basically say, hey, the Russian ship has to come out because we're now at war. And, and the other ships are like, well, we can't really take part. We're neutral. Yes. Can we get into the <laughs> weird rules of war? Okay, yeah. but first, so at the outbreak of the war, um, the population of Russia, I think, was around 130 million people. Japan was 40 million people. Um, Russia had a Navy that was the third largest Navy in the world. I think it was second only to obviously England and possibly France or Germany. It was, it was right up there as far as tonnage. I mean, it, it was, it had a massive Navy, massive army. Um, the Pacific fleet in Port Arthur was actually bigger than the entire Japanese fleet. And then Russia also had four cruisers in Vladivostok, um, and we can get into the types of ships next episode mm-hmm. and because that's really fascinating. Russia also had an, a fleet in the Baltic, their Baltic Sea Fleet, and then the Black Sea Fleet. Each fleet that they had was larger than the entire Japanese fleet. So they were they had a massive Navy. Um, but those two fleets were 10 to 18,000 miles away from Port Arthur. Um, Russia had a much bigger army, although they didn't have superior numbers necessarily at the outset of the war. They were able to bring in endless reinforcements. Um, Across a 6,000 mile railway. railway. Yeah. Um, Yeah, the the weird rules of war, neutrality, like one, technically you're supposed to declare war before you attack. But Mm -hmm. after this attack, most of the world, the Western world is like, eh, it's okay. Like England was totally for it because they had the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Um, France and Germany are like, eh, what do we care? And, and America is like, yeah, that serves them right. Like nobody ever, <laughs> nobody really felt bad for the Russians when they got, when they got a sneak attack by the Jap- Japanese um, on Port Arthur on February 8th. Yeah, and I think but at Chimopo, they, they basically gave the Russians the option the, the yeah. neutral power said, listen, you can you can get off your ships and we can basically Interior. there is that other rule of war. Like you can basically all give up your ability to fight. You get to go home, but you can't serve again, which I don't know how anyone verifies that. Um, but they you know, that was kind of offered to these Russian sailors on these ships in in Chimopo. And they said, no, we, we, we really shouldn't. We're going to go ahead and sail out there and just meet our fate. And, and they knew that in that particular case, they were outgunned. They were going to be wrecked. Yeah. So was it possible that they just underestimated the, the Japanese naval fleet? I mean, when you're talking about three to one um, numbers at, at the start, in, as far as an advantage yeah. um, for Russia, I, I would argue that it's got to be very possible, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I think they were, they were thinking, well, if we can break the blockade, we can make it to Vladivostok and team up with the cruisers there. But it's a weird rule, like this internment rule, like in these neutral ports, it's like, well, you, you can inter your ship. It won't get blown up, but it just won't serve in the war. Um, that was one of the weird rules. Another rule was um, neutral ports could only be available for 24 hours to belligerent navies. And so like if your Navy needed to refuel or restock only had 24 hours to do what it needed to do, or they could close the Harbor and take your ships. Like those are just the rules. Like it's just pretty it arbitrary. The rules. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they had negotiated these things and it's just like, it's just random. I, I guess it's not random. They're just like, well, what's, what's fair play, you know, in war. And that's how the, these customs had come up. Yeah. Um, like getting to base. I'm safe. Cool. I'm safe. You well, you have me. to leave at some point. Well, you can't yeah. hang out there. Yeah. You gotta <laughs> no stay, puppy guarding. <laughs> you got to stay three feet away. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple of uh, quotes that I want to, kind of wrap up with one was on the difference between um the the russian sailor versus the japanese counterpart it says the russian sailor so we talked about the russian sailors um officers were picked from aristocracy um they they were promoted 
through time at sea, which just meant like most of the time the sailors didn't even go out into the, they didn't even patrol on, on the boats. They just stayed in, in, in Harbor in port. Um, so they were on shore duty. Um, so it says, you know, they were conscripts, they weren't educated. Um, they weren't very motivated. They didn't have career advancement. So it says the Russian sailor was older than his Japanese counterpart less educated and less motivated he generally spent less time at sea and due to the incentive system or lack of one of one showed less initiative um and then this is that's from uh the book tsushima 1905 from lardis um mark lardis so and then the second quote he had is the imperial russian navy was not a bad navy but not nearly as good as it thought it was more importantly, it dangerously underestimated its most likely opponent, Japan. It could not imagine a non-European power fielding a competent navy. 300 successful years of fighting Asian nations left Russia with a dangerous blind spot. It was living on its reputation. Um, so going back to what you said, Cameron, yeah, Russia did underestimate Japan. I don't know if that at Chimolpu they did, but as a whole, the, the Russian navy un underestimated the Japanese Navy. The Tsar certainly underestimated um, the Japanese people and the Japanese nation. And it was, there was a casual racism and xenophobia to, to not just Tsar Nicholas, but European rulers around, you know, all over the continent at that time, just had this idea that there's no way Asian nations, the, their people aren't able to compete with our people and, and, um, you know, they'd use their, their early military successes to, in part, to bias that, that opinion. But yeah, they, the Russians specifically could not imagine one, they didn't think Japan was going to go to war with them, which I don't know how, when Japan was basically giving you every sign that they're going to go to war with somebody. They must've thought they were bluffing <laughs> at that point. I, I, I don't know, but yeah, as, as I was yeah. reading the whole, you know, xenophobia, racism, came up a lot, you know, um, Tsar Nicholas kind of deputized himself to be the guy that stopped the, the yellow race spreading across. A, oh know, yeah. Yellow East, peril or East right. Asia. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, here I am playing armchair quarterback years later after, you know, not knowing the whole story, but yeah, they, they definitely underestimated, um, Japan as a nation because, oh yeah, we're supposedly superior to them. And I think that really cost them down the road. So I have a <clears throat> kind of jumping on the back. I, I was looking for a quote as well. Um, and this is from uh, Rising Sun and Tumbling Bear. And he says, the crucial weakness of the Russian forces was the manifestation of the gerontocracy, uh, kind of that older class, right? Which evolved mm -hmm. from the general rule of seniority be being given precedence over talent, right? And so then you have uh, commanders lacked energy. Um, they were used to sitting on, on their rears. They displayed reluctance to make decisions and shoulder responsibility. Uh, they drank to excess, had little empathy with soldiers, which happens if you're from two different classes of people. If you're not coming up through the same system as everybody, you don't have the empathy with everyone else. Uh, they didn't have flexibility to react. And if in this case, uh, the Russians were likely the officers had to make all the decisions in, in contrast with what Japan was doing, where everyone was in the position to make a decision. So everyone had skin in the game here. It's the officers making all the decisions. If you're a conscript, you're just there to follow orders. Um, and they hadn't really, they weren't really ready to, make the changes necessary for this modern war. We're gonna see that in 1914 as well with all the old officers trying to run World War I in much the same way. But we, we've got a playbook right here in, in the Russo-Japanese War, but here's from um, <clears throat> this book, The Campaign with Kuropotkin, who is a Russian mm -hmm. general. When war broke out, the chief commands were in the hands of generals of a departed generation. Many of them were ignorant of the use of such ordinary instruments of modern warfare as wireless telegraphy, heliography, and flashlight signaling. I have known generals refuse permission for the erection of a heliograph apparatus on the ground that it was a mere toy. A heliograph being, a, I looked it up, it's like um, 
like a mirror signal so that you mm-hmm. can send flash uh, commands yeah. across miles. Yeah. Which would be very useful. And, you know, instead of sending a, a writer with a missive, you know, you could give commands instantly. Yeah, as as um, quick as, as combat and battles are going to move, this is, that's going to be important to communicate over miles or even mm-hmm. half a mile to get those people to do what you needed to do to react quickly to a situation. And uh, if you're going to refuse those new modern tools, I, you're done. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, so it, it, it kind of sets us up. I mean, this, this attack on Port Arthur, and we'll get into that next week, but it, it sets us up. We see the motivations. We see kind of this recent history between these two nations and in this race, they both have these, this race to have influence on mainland uh, China and, and the Korean Peninsula, although for very different reasons and, and for very different stakes. Um, but it's, it's a really fascinating conflict. The more I read about it, the more fascinated I was. And I, I can't wait to, to dig into more of it next week. So with that, um, what is it that we're going to look into next week? Oh, geez. Or Louise. next time. I mean, we're going to get into the actual battle of Port Arthur, the initial naval um, so, engagements. Yeah, a battle of Port Arthur, the original one, um, the initial land battles, the initial sea battles, um, and then the formation of the second Pacific Squadron, which is the, the fleet that's built in in, Saint P- in the Baltic Sea to relieve the Russians in the Pacific. Um, That's kind of the the gist. And then the week three will be the concluding land battles, the Battle of Tsushima, which is the major naval battle as well. So um, yeah, that's the plan. Excellent. Well, I'm going to, I'll end my part with this. Um, I tweeted out earlier today, I said, uh, and I tweeted to someone with the Twitter handle, uh, Czar Nick too said, we're doing a three-part series on your ill-fated war with Japan in 1905, 1905, cared a comment. And he said, it was a terrible idea and probably helped me get killed later. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's I also, mean, it's great so, we have a primary source who has a Twitter yeah, account. Yeah. And he can, <laughs> and he someone else feedback. also noted um, Theodore Roosevelt is going to end up in this story. He has a and very interesting part to play. He's going to earn a Nobel Prize for his part in this story. And this comment was uh, proof that a POTUS can earn this prize with actual tangible accomplishments. So taking a shot across the bow at a uh, Barry, Barack yeah, Obama. I, is it? I mean, I think it's taking a shot across the bow at multiple precedents. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, uh, looking forward to it. Uh, it's it's going to be good. All right. Um Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, This is Jake, got Cameron and Eric, and uh, we'll see you all next week.